All right, so our next talker is going to be Ryan O'Melia, uh, who's from the University of Oklahoma, and he's going to talk about uh, down and out, again, uh, ophthalmoplegic migraine. using a uh, awesome okay well thank you for the opportunity to come and speak with you guys um, yes it's titled down and out again and so three-year-old girl uh, comes to your office and you see this uh, this is a representative photo of course <laughs> not actual um, but yeah there, there's <laughs> decreased up gaze decreased down gaze and uh, decreased adduction of the, uh, the right eye. And so, yeah, hey, this is, this is pretty, pretty good. Um, third nerve palsy coming in. And so you get history of present illness. And uh, so it's three year, three month old girl um, with a past medical history of a third nerve palsy. Um, happened about two years ago. And it uh, spontaneously resolved over a few weeks. Um, this time though, she had, around Thursday, about five days ago, she had a GI illness with some, some nausea and vomiting, but um, no fever, no URI, uh, no cough or eye pain, not, not even a headache, actually. Um, and then by Saturday, so it, it resolves, and then the parents start to notice the, the lid drooping um, over the next day. You know, the eye kind of starts to, to go down and start to go out, and so she gets some eye wandering, and then they notice the pupils. Um, uh, are different sizes, and so, so they bring her in, and, um, and this is where we're at. Um, so, looking into the previous episode a little bit more, you see that the, um, the, it presented exactly the same way. Uh, Subacute onset over a few days, progressed to anisocorian strabismus, and then it resolves over a few weeks. It was treated at an outside hospital, and um, the MRI that they got there read that there was um, enhancement of the third nerve, contrast enhancement of the third nerve where it exits from the midbrain right there in the uh, cisternal segment. Um, they said it was consistent with inflammatory neuritis. Probably, you know, the most common etiology is just gonna be a, a post-viral neuritis. Um, so continuing on with the history and the findings, uh, past surgical history, medical medications and all that, all non-contributory. Family history, social history, view of symptoms, all, all just normal, uh, not really contributing to this. Um, on physical exam, uh, what you should notice right here, um, anisocoria, and then also you have the, the restriction of the gaze. Um, on pen light exam, right here, notice the, she's got the ptosis, and then her vitals are all normal, labs all normal um, so getting the MRI and the imaging what we see is enhancement of the third nerve right as it exits the brain stem um, and then even maybe a little bit as it progresses up higher um, this is the actual image this isn't representative this is the image of um, the three-year-old girl and then here's a coronal view of the MRI with contrast and you do see the contrast enhancement of the third nerve and then even moving back a little bit further, you see it really light up. And uh, this is the read um, from the radiologist and when it's compared to the prior MRI from the other episode. It's the stable thickening uh, right there at the, the root um, exit zone of the third nerve. And so for a differential on this, you know, maybe, maybe it's just another episode of post viral neuritis. Maybe she's kind of unlucky with that. Um, or it could be ophthalmoplegic migraine. Um, other things to, to definitely rule out uh, when, when looking at a case like this, you want a little aneurysm, schwannoma, Tolosa hunt, um, acute demyelinating encephalomyelopathy, uh, and Miller Fisher syndrome. Um, all these uh, other ones, they, you know, the natural history of the aneurysm and the schwannoma is going to be more progressive rather than this episodic. Um, then Tolosa Hunt's going to be on the MRI is going to be affect more like a cavernous sinus area, and then these would also have um, other neurologic deficits coming along with them most likely. And so we'll just continue to talk about this one 
because it's going to be the most interesting and uh, controversial rather than the post-viral neuritis. Um, so for ophthalmophagic migraine, the epidemiology, it's, it's actually, a, it's quite rare and it, it mainly affects children and, um, and females. The median age is gonna be about eight years old. Um, signs and symptoms, basically, I mean, it's, it's kind of self-explanatory. You've got um, a headache that's then followed by ophthalmophagia and it usually takes about, it can be immediate or it can be up to, to about 14 days and the headache, um, many times it has migraineous characteristics which actually led to the naming of this. Um, oftentimes you can get photophobia, phonophobia, nausea, vomiting. These numbers all come from a, a paper published in 2012 um, by Gelfin. And, um, and then with, as far as the ophthalmophagia, uh, the most common nerve to be affected is the third cranial nerve, um, followed by that, the, the sixth cranial nerve. And then sometimes you can get multiple nerves um, but when you do have multiple nerves, it's pretty much always that you will have cranial nerve three involvement. Um, lots of words on this slide. The overall, what I, what I want you to get from this is that this is the description and, um, and diagnostic criteria put forth by the International Headache Society in their publication of the International Classification of Headache Disorders. And, and what's interesting about this is that uh, is the evolution of, of the diagnostic criteria for this has actually mirrored the thinking for the etiology of ophthalmoplegic migraine. The first time, um, in the first edition, the ICHD-1, it was actually characterized as a migraine variant. Um, and then in the second edition, what they did is they got away from that and they categorized it as a cranial neuralgia. And they still kept the migraine name, it was still called ophthalmoplegic migraine, but, um, oh, and it also had to be a migraine-like headache. Um, but they were kind of getting away from the migraine a little bit. And then now in this third edition, um, they've actually completely recategorized it into a cranial neuropathy, and they've gotten away from the, the naming of ophthalmoplegic migraine. It's no longer called that, it's actually called recurrent painful ophthalmophagic neuropathy, much easier to say. Um, <laughs> but yeah, and so it, it's, there, it's mirroring the thinking of the etiology on this, and it's, they no longer have to be migraine-like headaches. They actually just have to be unilateral uh, and ipsilateral to where the ophthalmophagia is gonna occur, and the ophthalmophagia can occur up to 14 days out. Um, and so where all this controversy is coming from is actually the imaging and how to explain the, how this imaging abnormality happens along with the clinical characteristics. And the imaging abnormality, like we saw in our patient, is, this is from the literature, um, this is a 1998 article, um, you get this cranial nerve enhancement of the oculomotor nerve right as it exits the midbrain. Um, Here's another one from the literature, right there, a coronal section. And this is a reversible enhancement. Um, and so it's just, the controversy comes from like, how do we explain this reversible enhancement? And there's kind of two camps from what I found in, in my research. You get, um, it either could be a neuropathy or it could actually be a migraine. And like I was saying, the, the trend right now is getting away from a migraine and towards a neuropathy possibly viral um, or autoimmune, but, but the still don't really know what exactly is causing it. And then as far as migraine, the, the thinking behind how a migraine could cause it is that the migraine induces a vasospasm, which then induces ischemia to the third nerve, which then causes a reversible breakdown of the nerve blood barrier, allowing for the contrast to leak out. Um, and this paper was actually published very recently in 2014, and so you can, as you can see, um, arguments for pro-migraine are still very much in process. Um, this, the big takeaway is that like the jury's still out. We don't know exactly what causes it or, or how exactly to categorize it. Um, but the good news is, for our patient, the treatment remains the same. We still give them steroids, um, and the prognosis is very good. Most people have a spontaneous resolution of symptoms and um, the enhancement of the third nerve goes away. And uh, usually it, it just happens over a few weeks and 
Sometimes they can persist, but um, that usually happens with recurrent bouts. And so I'll open up the floor to any questions. There's no references. You. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. You, yeah. You know, that's a good question. Um, I honestly, I, I don't know what exactly the dosing is or, or the route of the steroids on that. Yes? Is it more expensive the steroids than the migraine Typically, what I found in, in the reading and in the literature is that the migraine medications don't help that much um, and that it is more responsive to steroids. Um, and that there's all these arguments as to like what is the etiology, and that is one of the reasons um, people often give for it not being um, a, a migrainous cause. Is there any case of uh, you, you have to rule that out. That's actually one of the rule out criteria for ophthalmoplegic migraine or this RPON. Um, it is a diagnosis of exclusion, and so you have to, to rule that out. It, that's a great question. Um, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, I, it's about, in, in the uh, 2012 study by Gelfin, uh, it was about 67% had a history, a personal history of, of migraine. Family history? Family history, there, there was also, I don't remember the exact number off the top of my head, but yes, there was also a strong family history, which was an argument for migraine. It was attributed to the muscle imbalance. It wasn't a super concerning, um, it wasn't a super concerning uh, occurrence. Uh, I think it wasn't happening extremely often and the, and the parents were saying, you know, this isn't happening when she's walking, it's just like, you know, she's, whenever she's really running, she, it just maybe we think that she's falling down a little bit more and so, yeah, good question though.